Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. I'm Raihan Salam, president of the Manhattan Institute, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the 2023 City Journal Awards. We debuted this award last year, and we can already declare success. We somehow bamboozled you to navigating midtown traffic on a school night to be here with us, and that's a big accomplishment. So thank you again. We know you could be anywhere tonight. We know you're very busy people, and we're honored to have you. Now, I suspect the reason you're here is because you all share a deep appreciation for City Journal and the indispensable role it plays in American public life. Like many of you, I'm a New Yorker, and I remember a time decades ago when the city was seen as a lost cause. I lived through the muggings and the robberies, crime, drugs, homelessness, vandalism, disastrous finances, failing schools. For the city's residents, these weren't just headlines. They were indignities that piled up and filled decent, law-abiding people with fear and a sense of hopelessness. Many people intuitively understood what needed to be done, but fierce opposition from the keepers of elite opinion or from parties invested in the status quo made them despair of trying or even speaking out. One institution that was not intimidated was City Journal. Founded in 1989 near the city's nadir, the magazine set out to prove that New York and other great American cities could make a comeback. Issue after issue, City Journal published hard-headed analysis grounded in data and common sense, illuminating the alternative. Public disorder did not have to be tolerated. Urban schools could educate students. A functioning public sector was possible. In the face of derision or outright hostility, the magazine and its contributors offered one detailed proposal after another for making these aspirations reality. Today, it is tempting to look across the American landscape and feel a similar sense of despair. Many cities are backsliding, experiencing crime waves not seen since those dark days of the early 90s. Important cultural institutions are under assault. Ideologues are gaslighting the public about timeless truths pertaining to human nature and human flourishing. At a time when there are so many opportunities around which Americans can unite, we are being segregated into racial identity groups by supposedly enlightened purveyors of division. Yet just as it led the way in revitalizing Gotham, City Journal is at the forefront of these crucial debates too. In its pages, America's most original thinkers are shaping the national conversation on a wide range of issues, exposing the dangers of DEI and the excesses of radical gender theory, or analyzing the astonishing decline of California and the battle for parental rights in the suburbs of Virginia. And now as ever, the magazine remains a voice of sanity on the future of the American city, serving as the inspiration for a new urban reform movement. And this work is driving results. City Journal's brilliant team strives to produce journalism that will inform thoughtful readers and spur them to action. And they've been wildly successful. In the magazine's early days, each issue was read by no more than a few thousand readers. Today, every quarter, our website alone gets millions of visits. Yet City Journal's influence is measured not only in how many read the magazine, but who reads it, and where. In the halls of government, in corporate boardrooms, in school board meetings, and in neighborhoods across the country, City Journal is now essential reading. And when we see City Journal essays form the basis of presidential executive orders or policy proposals that become state law, we know we are having an impact. Tonight's honoree, Chris Rufo, epitomizes this success. In this way, City Journal is and always has been central to the Manhattan Institute's mission of promoting economic opportunity, individual liberty, and the rule of law. Everyone here tonight understands that these freedoms are precious and their advances fragile. Even if a policy approach or governing philosophy has been proven right once, it must be re-articulated and defended again and again. 
Facts are stubborn things, but so it turns out are really bad ideas. And as new challenges arise, it takes someone to explain and adapt hard-earned lessons and time-tested wisdom to overcome them. This is where a publication dedicated to good ideas and fearless in its defense of them is essential. The values the Manhattan Institute stands for consistently find their most articulate and sharp presentation in City Journal. Uncowed by elite cynicism and cancel culture outrage, City Journal exists to ensure that the day's most important stories and most promising thinking can always find a home. This work is vital, but it's not easy. It takes intellectual honesty, cultural sophistication, persistence, patriotism, and courage. And it takes steadfast support, which is why we are so grateful to all of you here this evening. I would especially like to thank our trustees who are with us, our chairman, Paul Singer, our vice chair, Ann Charters, Ken Gilman, Harvey Golub, Chairman Emeritus Roger Hertog, Susie Leibovitz Edelman, Joe Crystal, Nick O'Neill, Russell Penoyer, as well as tonight's patrons and benefactors. By investing in City Journal, you are making a wager that decline is not foreordained, that free and vigorous debate is still possible, that evidence and reason can still win the day, and that a plucky journal of ideas is still capable of transforming a city and a nation. This is a hopeful bet, but it is one we cannot afford to lose. At the Manhattan Institute, we are all in. After dinner, we'll hear from City Journal's editor, Brian Anderson, who has been instrumental in making the magazine the journalistic powerhouse it is today. He'll be presenting the 2023 award to Chris Rufo, a visionary public intellectual and valued colleague who embodies the best of City Journal's fighting spirit. Please enjoy your dinner, and we'll resume at 8.35 for their remarks. Thank you. I wanted to uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, reiterate Ryan's point about the support of our trustees. It's, it's wonderful to see such a full room. And I'm thrilled to introduce this year's City Journal Award recipient, Christopher Rufo, whose writing and activism exemplifies everything the award stands for. We've been proud to publish his work in City Journal and are pleased to recognize him tonight. Now, only a few years ago, uh, Chris was enjoying a thriving filmmaking career. He spent his 20s traveling the world to produce documentaries for PBS, Netflix, other, other major networks. And in fact, Chris's first mention in the New York Times goes back 15 years ago. We, we looked into this. And it isn't some warning about his dark influence on America's cultural debate. Uh, from a newspaper that would later, recently, brand him a right-wing Leninist. <laughs> uh, instead, it's, it's a favorable piece. It's a brief review of his documentary about traveling through Mongolia. The reviewer notes his good eye for the unusual. And that talent, I think, has remained a key feature in Chris's work and his writing. He grew up in Sacramento and has described himself as kind of bohemian in nature. And during you know, high school and college, like many people, he embraced a left-wing outlook. And it might not be so surprising in his case because the members of his extended family in Italy were committed Marxists. But after observing the realities of authoritarianism while making a film in communist China, he began to embrace more conservative views. He eventually settled in Seattle, where he continues to live. And by the mid-2010s, he was working on a film about three down-and-out American cities, Youngstown, Memphis, and Stockton. He was struck by the parallels between the policies that failed these cities and those pushed by progressive politicians and activists in Seattle and he began turning his investigative lens on his hometown, which was now you know, experiencing rampant street homelessness, rising property crime rates, um, and increasingly a, a hostile environment for businesses. 
So urged by friends, and this was doubtless, as he would admit, a mistake, he ran for city, Seattle City Council, you know, promising to bring new ideas uh, to the policy debate. His campaign was actually getting traction, but after opponents posted his home address on utility polls throughout the city, stalked his son online, and tried to get his wife fired from her tech job, uh, you know, that was enough. He withdrew from the race and committed himself to becoming a, a, a journalist. And what a journalist he's become. It's, it's been extraordinary. His first essay for City Journal appeared just five years ago. Seattle Under Siege, it was called, and it trained his eye for the unusual on Seattle's homelessness industrial complex. It was a tour de force of analysis and reporting and we made it a cover story. And that started what has been an incredibly fruitful and impactful collaboration. He continued to report for us on Seattle's profligate social programs, which harmed the very people they were meant to help, while corroding the city's quality of life. Now, Chris says he's an activist by accident. And it was while writing on Seattle that he received documentation from a city worker of an internal training session on interrupting whiteness. Uh, he wrote an expose for City Journal on it. It went viral. And he followed up soon after with a piece on critical race theory's influence on federal agencies. Chris's writing eventually inspired a presidential order banning such training in the federal bureaucracy, though President Biden would undo it. But by now, Chris started getting scores of whistleblower accounts of racialized curricula and programs. So we published a series of pieces revealing that CRT, critical race theory, had spread to K through 12 schools throughout the country and to many other American institutions. So it's, it's become easy to agree with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis' judgment that Chris has done more than anybody else in our country in exposing CRT. But it wasn't just CRT that was corrupting America's institutions. Chris also began to report on radical gender theories growing hold on public education. And he revealed the alarming reality through a whole series of pieces that a number of schools are now encouraging transgender ideology and some have even tried to facilitate students' gender transitions without parental consent. So his work on these radical developments, as, as we can see from that film that was just shown, have catapulted him to national notice. He's, he's pretty fair to say the left's public enemy number one right now. It's not just any conservative writer who gets branded a powerful and dangerous threat to democracy, <laughs> as Yale professor Jason Stanley called him. Uh, he's been subject of multiple profiles, including in the Washington Post, the New York Times, the New Yorker, and other you know, progressive outlets. These pieces are often intended as hit jobs, but if you, you follow Chris's trajectory on these, the same thing always happens. He walks away unscathed, highlighting the distortions on social media, and often getting the key charges dropped or apologized for by the publications in question. Yet, you know, despite this onslaught of hostility, uh, Chris maintains this incredibly sunny disposition. It's one of the easiest people I have ever had to deal with in my entire career. So, uh, you know, Chris, I don't know how you do it. I'd, I'd lose my marbles. Um, you know, Barry Weiss calls Chris the most important and effective conservative activist in the country. And members of Congress, state legislators, and local officials have sought his advice regularly on how to combat the various trends that he's been documenting with his writing and reporting. Dozens of states have now passed measures to ban racial and sexual indoctrination in schools, 
And this has really helped spark a, a parents' rights movement across the country that's become a, a force in elections. And really a lot of that is, is down to Chris's work. Uh, earlier this year, uh, Governor DeSantis appointed Chris to the board of New College of Florida. This is a small public liberal arts college was struggling with financial instability. It wasn't doing very well. The governor tasked Chris and his fellow trustees with transforming the curriculum away from radical leftism and making the school into a, a classical liberal institution. And so far, so good. Not only has the gender studies program been abolished, uh, Yeah, the, the school has received uh, considerable new funding, and it is welcoming the largest incoming class in its history. Now, these efforts have sparked a remarkable amount of outrage on the left. This is, you know, after all, just one tiny school in a vast American university system dominated by the left and progressives. And you know, late last week, the Biden administration opened a civil rights investigation into New College. The allegation that the college's administrators and trustees, including Chris, had violated the law by, among other things, abolishing the gender studies program and misgendering a former diversity officer who prefers Z, Zer pronouns. <laughs> But think about that. The federal government is going after Chris and New College uh, by basically trying to instantiate a right to be called by neo-pronouns. So the implications of that suit are, are quite significant. But in the broad sense of, of what's going on, all of this fury, I think, is just another indication of how Chris continues to get results. He has just released his first book, America's Cultural Revolution, which traces the intellectual origins of the left's campaign to remake the nation. Uh, the book, as, as Ryan mentioned, debuted on the New York Times bestseller list. It went to number one on Amazon. Conservatives have hailed it as one of the most important books of recent years. Uh, writing for the Washington Post, Hugh Hewitt uh, calls it a spectacular work of research and precision. But what's been fascinating to watch is that the book has also won respect from quarters not otherwise disposed to Chris's view of the world. So The Atlantic calls it ethically refreshing. And The Economist rates it as persuasive and well-written and praises its meticulous research. So, you know, all of this is basically just to say that few writers and activists have had such a significant influence on American society in such a short period of time, we're really talking about five years, uh, as Chris has, has, has accomplished. So it's, it's really my honor to present him with this year's second uh, annual City Journal Award. Uh, so please join me in congratulating Chris Rufo. Thank you. <laughs> Well, that was fan the video was a little embarrassing, but that was very nice. Um, I appreciate it. You know, um, I guess I should say I, I talked with uh, Ilana uh, Golant and some of the events team a few months ago, and they said, we want to talk. We want to have a set up a Zoom. Okay, what do you want to talk about? We really want to invite you to work on the logistics for the City Journal Awards. Um, we really want to, you know, blah, blah, blah. We're getting into logistics, and I was like, oh, this is pretty uh, high level of detail. And I said, well, that's great. You know, and they were talking. I said, well, hey, hold on. Who is the award for? And I said, no, the award is for you. I said, oh, this is, this is sounding much better now. I like this. I'd be happy to come. Um, but but I, w I will say, it, is, um, it, it really is an honor. And I think, uh, oh, it is. Because getting an award from your, your colleagues, people you, that know you best, that you work with every day, um, is something really special. And uh, last year's was Heather McDonald, who has just been an incredible uh, uh, inspiration for me over the years. Amazing. And the whole history of, of City Journal, you know, as I was researching uh, for the book, um, trying to find out, you know, what was happening in the 90s and early 2000s on some of these issues, I always found myself uh, leading back to City Journal pieces and in particular leading back to Heather's work. And I said, ah, oh, man, Heather was on this one again in 95, you know. <laughs> When I was a, a, a lad, um, 
but it, it really shows this amazing continuity of this work. Um, these are principles that we've had that, that we're not inventing, we're inheriting, we're reinterpreting, and we're reawakening in people. Um, and I see that in City Journal uh, every day, both in the work of my colleagues in the current period, as well as the great archives. Um, but what I wanted to talk about in this, my brief remarks, is something that I've learned about activism the last few years. As, as Brian mentioned, I was an accidental activist, and that experience that he brought up about my, my abortive and, and really quixotic run for the Seattle City Council um, is one that still stings a little bit. Um, it still stings, but I will say, in that six-week period of this attempt, naive attempt, I learned everything there is to know about politics. I mean, really and truly. You learn uh, how power works. You learn how language works. You learn how media works. You learned how um, institutions work. And then you learn how, when all of those things start to assemble and start to kind of come after you, then the thugs come after you. They find out where your kids go to school. They threaten your family. And that was, for me, a, a kind of terrifying period. And quitting was something that I really don't do. It wasn't in my DNA. It wasn't something I was happy about. But I had to make the choice to bow out, which actually turned out to be ph phenomenal. Uh, because even if you had won, imagine being, uh, having the Seattle City Council job, you know, one of the worst jobs you could ever have. So kind of a blessing in disguise. But I think it really did two things. I saw what I think of as the hideous face of the left. Let's be honest about it. If you see what they've done to major cities, if you see what they're doing to kids, if you're seeing what they've done to our institutions, um, behind the mask of tolerance, behind the mask of diversity, equity, and inclusion, which will go down in history as some kind of Soviet and Orwellian term, you see something much darker. You see something much more sinister. And I actually saw it face to face. I mean, really, truly face to face. And when I say a hideous face of the left or the hideous face of revolution, which is the first sentence uh, in, the, in the preface to my book, um, I actually mean it. I've seen these people face to face. I've seen their eyes at, at close distance. And, and I really understood what we're, we're dealing with. And so after licking my wounds and uh, you know, making some changes. Um, I think it gave me a sense of mission, and it also gave me a sense of how things actually work. And I think what I've learned about conservatives is that uh, sometimes conservatives have a tendency to treat politics as if it were an Oxford-style debate. You get in a beautiful room like this one, this person talks, this person talks, the audience sorts out the best idea, and the best idea wins. Um, that's not how it works, though. And so I saw, and I learned from the best, I learned from the absolute whack jobs in Seattle, um, uh, uh, how to pursue uh, cha political change, uh, uh, how to you know, work uh, with media and narrative construction, and then how to actually drive home policy results. And so you study from your losses, and you learn a thing or two. Um, and I think that's why I've maybe flummoxed critics uh, as well. You know, they... they have all sorts of scary phrases that they deploy about me, and I find them just delightful and entertaining. Uh, I'm kind of collecting more of them, and uh, I even, don't tell anyone, but I even have seeded negative stories about me in the press. I've actually given them tips, you know, hey, this is, try this angle, you know. Um, and, and I think of it almost like you're creating your own villain narrative, you know, <laughs> because you have to enjoy it a little bit. And a couple things that I think are essential and what we're doing at Manhattan Institute more broadly. Um, how I look at the work that I've done the last few years, it's really just three simple steps. It starts with reporting. There's a lot of people that offer commentary. There are a lot of people who offer their opinion. There are very few people who offer hard-hitting, meaningful, and important new facts and information. And that's the lifeblood of the work that we're in in media. And that's actually the lifeblood of how you change how people think, how you change how people perceive institutions and policies and cultural issues. And so working with the great City Journal editors and sources all over the country, that's the work that I think starts everything. If you want to, you can say critical race theory is a problem. You can say DEI is a problem. You could say trans ideology and medical practices are a problem. 
But when you have the documents, when you have the information, when you have the, the, the words, images, pictures, PowerPoints, vi videos, God forbid, on some of that stuff, that's really when you can bring people into something, make it meaningful to them, and then craft it in a way and tell the story in a way that leads people towards asking more questions and then ultimately leads people towards demanding concrete changes. And to me, the best moment in all of this was when I was doing these critical race theory stories, just hammering at these things. Every week, every week, every week, showing them, you know, uh, racially scapegoating kids in schools, segregating kids by race in schools, um, teaching that the United States was a historic force for evil uh, to kids starting in kindergarten. Um, this media narrative started to develop. It started to say, okay, there's a pattern here. You know, you always want to do like 10 or 12 stories to establish a pattern. That's what I've learned. Otherwise, they'll dismiss you as, oh, that's an, that's an outlier. You're, you're, you, that's, that's not really happening. And then it turns into, it, it is happening, and it's actually good that it's happening. And there's that twitch. Um, or my favorite, actually, one of the reviewers recently said, um, Rufo's book is, is, is exaggerated. There's no cultural evolution happening. Um, I looked at the data, and between 2010 and 2017, there was very little left-wing violence. I says, wait a minute. You're leaving out 2020. Kind of an important date. And uh, his argument amounted to, um, um, and then he said, and, and even, you know, even such, the, the left-wing fanaticism and the defund the police movement and all of these things, well, they're starting to decline. So well, which one is it? Is it not happening or is it declining? And his position was to have it both ways. But what you have to do in every case is just hit them, hit them, hit them with things that cannot be debated. They cannot be disputed. And you just submit them to the public discourse. The second element is to do the activism component, which uh, in my case as a person in media is really just arguing and fighting, something that I love to do. Um, you, know, uh, you know, there's a, I don't know if you've ever heard of this, um, I guess she's like a Japanese kind of tidiness expert, Marie Kondo. Have you heard about this? You know. Um, and I was talking with my wife about this, and, uh, and we were laughing. She, I said, the Marie Kondo's thing is you have to pick the little knickknacks that spark joy. Um, and I was like, fighting with people about politics for me sparks joy. You know? <laughs> so, so I love it. I mean, I, I, really, I, I really can't get enough. I love it. You know? So you know, sometimes I'll come home and say, hey, Tell my family, you won't believe it. It's also very odd because I live in a small town in the middle of nowhere. No one's in politics, no one's in academia. I said, ah, you wouldn't believe it. This exciting thing happened today. A process server came to my house and, and subpoenaed me on behalf of the ACLU. Isn't that exciting? You know, he's like, or, or, you know, I'm under federal civil rights investigation for refusing to use Zer pronouns. How cool is that? You know, <laughs> um, and, uh, my wife is like, don't tell me these things. Just, uh, I, I'm sure it's very exciting, but for me, it's very scary. Um, but it's the actual, the heart of the political debate that we need to be having. And we have to be fearless in how we approach it. And we have to have fun with it. We have to be courageous and joyful and even sometimes playful and willing to also take some of that incoming fire um, and learning how to sometimes manipulate it, sometimes absorb it, sometimes redirect it, um, but never taking it to heart, never letting people who hate you, who hate your values and who do not desire your success, to actually uh, internalize their definitions of who you are. And the third key element of what I've been doing and I think what we're doing at Manhattan Institute more broadly is to turn all of these, hey look, it's good to do reporting, it's good to do some of the fighting, but ultimately it has to lead towards public policy. And there are also some people in the conservative think tank world that, that still surprises me, who they'll say, oh, Chris, I saw you on stage with DeSantis. I saw you go see Trump. I saw you go over here and talk with the state senators. You know, don't you feel like that's, you know, demeaning or degrading? Or it's like, you know, you're, you're, you're with politicians now. You're doing, po you know. I said, what on earth are you talking about? What are you doing? You work for a think tank, not a Manhattan Institute, of course. Um, uh, but our competitors, uh, you know. But I say, you work in politics. Don't you want to be there on stage when your idea turns into law? To me, that's the most exciting part. That's the, the, the kind of, the, the little trinket, the little prize at the end of the process is you do the reporting, you come up with a solution, you fight for it, 
And then eventually, a group of people get together in a state legislature. They hash it out as they hash it out. And then you show up, and then they sign the bill. I mean, that to me is, is the, the, the essence of the process. Because if we really believe in our principles, if we really believe our ideas could make our institutions better, our schools better, our society better, we should have the self-confidence to not just desire, but to demand that those ideas become law. And that is the role of public policy. And what I've learned is that something that you may have learned uh, uh, in, in, in elementary school civics class is that to get policy done requires what kind of people? Politicians, right, ultimately? Uh, that is what our country is. We are a republic. And so um, ultimately that's what I think uh, uh, drives what I'm doing. Um, that's what I think has made it successful. Uh, I've always made a specific ask. I always say, you, you know, you're really upset about this thing that I'm telling you about. You know, horrific transgender surgeries that I've exposed or uh, horrific and abusive pedagogical practices in schools. Um, but outrage for the sake of outrage is, is demoralizing, it's enervating, it's self-destructive. You have to cultivate that emotional response in the public and then guide them towards concrete action that will actually improve their lives. And so that's what we're doing, that's the formula that I've learned by accident the last few years um, through this, uh, 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 some study, some trial and error, and then just really following my instincts. Um, and uh, that's just been such a joy, and it's been such a joy to do it with Manhattan Institute and with City Journal. Um, I was somewhat surprised, but also relieved to hear from Brian that I'm one of the easiest contributors to work with. Uh, you know, that's, uh, that's fantastic. Um, but it, it really is something special that we're doing. And so, as I was thinking, every year I start with a theme. In 2021, it was critical race theory. In 2022, it's gender ideology. In 2023, it's been DEI. And all of those issues have percolated to the surface and we've seen great, great changes in all of those. And I was thinking about next year. What do I wanna do next year? Do I wanna roll into another issue? Do I wanna roll into another topic? And it came to my attention through some conversations with colleagues and friends and, and, and advisors that it's maybe an opportunity to level up and to do what I do but try to do it at a larger scale. And so, uh, what we've decided to do at Manhattan Institute, and we're going to be rolling it out in the coming weeks, you're the first to hear about it, except some people I told last night, but I told them not to tell anyone else until after 8 p.m. tonight, so, well, they might have already told some people. But what we're doing is we're going we're gonna to launch a new fellowship program that is really dedicated to the spirit of constructive activism. We're going to recruit 10 people who have projects that they're, that they're working on, whatever the topic might be on really this cultural set of issues. Um, we're gonna train them on how to turn their intellectual work, their journalistic work, their think tank work um, into a, a, a real a public narrative, how to drive public uh, interest, how to change public perceptions, how to really conquer and win the public debate. And then we're gonna connect them with resources, opportunities, cable news bookings, um, other activist organizations within our greater sphere, uh, policy proposals, to then actually get all of these individual projects off the ground and to make sure that they're delivering concrete and tangible results by the end of the year. So it's gonna be 10 projects over the course of a year. And what I hope, you can never get 10 out of 10, but what I hope that we can do is have the kind of success that we've seen on critical race theory, the kind of success we've seen on gender ideology, and then my favorite this year, the kind of success we've seen in permanently shutting down DEI departments in every public university in Florida and in Texas. And not calling anyone a Zer during that whole process. Um, what I'm hoping we can do is that we can get out of this group of 10, three or four projects that can expand the playing field. And so, as I've cultivated this reputation as a master of the dark arts, and a threat to democracy, and a right-wing Leninist, and whatever other colorful uh, 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 monikers I've, I've earned, um, I, I think this is gonna make them quite scared. Uh, I think the idea of having eight or 10 projects that are working, that are fighting, that are making headway, that are, that are modeled on the kind of success that we've had at City Journal and Manhattan Institute, 
um, is going to really pioneer something that is totally new uh, in the conservative world, in the think tank world. Um, and I think we're going to see something that is delivering meaningful changes to people where they live. And that's ultimately what I'm trying to do. You know, I, I come to rooms like this and crowds like this. It's quite exciting. Um, but my day-to-day -day life is actually quite relaxed. I live in a very small town. Uh, uh, we just got some acreage that we're going to be you know, retreating to uh, on the occasion, uh, picking apples and these kind of things. Um, but what I think that we're going to do is really uh, gear up for next year in a way that is expanding this cultural fight um, all over the country, across all domains. And I want to see um, all of the people who are joining this program to be standing on that stage by the end of the year, whether it's in Florida or in Texas or in Tennessee or uh, uh, in Idaho, and, and saying that in one year, we've delivered these incredible victories. And so um, I appreciate you all for coming. I appreciate uh, everyone. Um, I hope to meet some of you after, after the uh, dinner. And uh, thanks again to City Journal, to Brian, to Paul, to Raihan, to Alana, to Brandon, I think, was maybe here even, uh, and to everyone else. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Menon Institute Executive Vice President Alana Gallant. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, and congratulations. Chris's story is true. I called him up, and there was a little bit of miscommunication, but I am so glad that he accepted tonight's honor, and it has been such a pleasure and privilege to work with Chris over the past few years to conspire. Uh, we're especially excited about this new fellowship program. We've been doing intense brainstorms over the past few weeks, and we're really excited for the program to launch and for the impact to come. As you've seen this evening, there's no publication in America quite like City Journal. From investigative exposés and original research to policy prescriptions and arts criticism, City Journal engages every facet of our culture and politics to make our cities and our society more vibrant, safe, and free. City Journal takes particular pride in finding brilliant writers and thinkers like Clarisse and ensuring that in an age of censorship and cancellation, their important work finds a broad audience. In the months ahead, we have exciting plans to expand our reach and build upon City Journal's success. This mission requires fearlessness and dedication. It also requires continued investment. If you'd like to support City Journal's essential work, we've made it easy for you. On your seat this evening, we've placed cards with QR codes so you can make a donation online or place the pledge cards in the boxes on your tables. We couldn't do this without all of you. Thank you for supporting City Journal and for joining us in this fight. Thank you to our events, marketing, and development teams for making tonight's event a success. And now I want to take a moment to recognize the City Journal team, led by Brian Anderson and Paul Beston for the past 17 years. Their leadership, their dedication, their creativity has been remarkable uh, and their impact unparalleled. So please join me in thanking Brian, Paul, and the entire City Journal team.